going to start and <clears throat> sorry we're going to pray we'll pray and get started in our class today on keys to supernatural ministry okay Shri Kumar why don't you pray please and then we'll get started sure pastor um Father, we thank you and praise you and honor you, God, for this wonderful morning that you've given to us, O God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that your presence, O Father God, guide us and lead us, fill us with your insight and wisdom and understanding, so that, Father God, we can able to grasp every revelation which is going to come out from the mouth of your servant, O God, Master, so that we can able to hold on it, and, Father God, we can move further, O God. Let every word and every revelation which is going to come let it energize and Lord Master, let it Lord Master, let it strengthen our spiritual life so that we can be a testimony for the kingdom. And Father God, we can expand your kingdom, O oh God. We submit ourselves into your mighty hand and we ask you, Holy Spirit, let your presence lead us and guide us. Thank you for this wonderful time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, Shikamar. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Roman, for. Uh, joining this class, Keys to Supernatural Ministry. Uh, I know we had a break last week. I, uh, I was um, tending to something else. So uh, I just want to quickly, you know, just do a quick recap of uh, what we've covered. So uh, in our first section, we talked about the possibility of uh, uh, the supernatural. That means uh, we said, you know, all of us as believers can experience the supernatural and can be used by God for the supernatural, to see the supernatural take place in people's lives and so on. So we covered that. We gave four reasons. Uh, and they're not just four, but four main reasons why you know, that is valid. And you and I should be absolutely convinced that God will work in us and through us in this for the supernatural to take place. Then we began to talk about the keys to supernatural ministry. The first key that we talked about is uh, understanding the spiritual realm, right? So uh, we need to understand how the spiritual realm operates because the supernatural really is the spiritual overriding the natural. So we are co-working with God, connecting with God in the spirit in order to override something that's happening in the natural that's the supernatural taking place. So we must understand the spiritual realm. We need to be very keen, very sensitive. We need to understand um, that from the spiritual realm, I can influence, I can affect change in the natural realm. That's the first key. And the second key, which we started talking about two weeks ago and we didn't complete it, uh, was the key of faith. Right. So this is a very important key because it is faith that connects us with God. And um, I know we did a full course on faith in the first year, uh, but I, uh, you know, we're just touching on some important elements about faith, especially in, in relation to the supernatural, whether it's receiving the supernatural or ministering the supernatural. Right. So that's what we uh, we were doing in our last class, and I want to just continue that and complete it today. Uh, faith has a very important key in both receiving the supernatural and ministering the supernatural. Now, uh, let's just quickly review some of the things that we have said before uh, we go into the new insights here. So what we did cover when we talked about the key of faith is, uh, you know, we said that Jesus taught us, you know, faith is key to seeing the spiritual bear upon the natural. You know, whether he, he said in John 11, 40, he said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. In Matthew 17, he said, faith like a mustard seed can move a mountain. So a spiritual thing happening, uh, faith, believing God, causing the glory of God to be revealed in the natural. But then we started emphasizing one, uh, you know, some key things here when we want to either receive the supernatural or minister the supernatural. And we were talking about this. We said our will is involved, you see. So 
uh, when we talk about faith, uh, in, uh, engaging in faith, uh, our will is involved. So if we want to see the supernatural happen, we've got to be determined to receive it, right? Uh, we said, you know, it's not just, it's not just going to fall off, uh, you know, like the phrase we use, like cherries of a, you know, ripe cherries of a tree. Uh, our will is involved. Now, understand that, and this, these are things that we did speak in our last class, that there is the norm and God is sovereign, so there will always be the things that he does on his own. But the norm, meaning this is how he told us to come to him, is you come in faith, you believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So this is accessible to everybody. Everybody can engage with God in faith. And there will be times when God will move supernaturally, or let's say uh, sovereignly, uh, independent of people's faith. There will be times. But that's God's prerogative. He will do it as and when he pleases. But what's open to all of us is we can initiate it by faith. That means we can go to the word of God and say, God, your word says it. Now I'm by faith. I am taking it for myself or when we minister to others. But faith is involved. Now, uh, in order, uh, sorry, in order to exercise faith, our will is involved. So this is where one area, the, the reason I emphasize it is this is one area many people tend to miss it, right? They, uh, let me just um, look at your faces. <laughs> All right, I just came on the screen so I can look at you while I'm talking. All right. Um, yeah, so this is where many believers miss it, meaning uh, the notion is if God wants me to have it, I will have it. But Jesus emphasized, you desire, you will, means you must engage with your will, then you will have it. So because many believers position themselves saying, God, if you want it, I will get it. But that's not the place we have to be in order to exercise faith. In order to exercise faith, we have to say, God, you have promised it, and I will have it. Right? My will is involved. Meaning, I am God is already, God's end is already confirmed because He promised. He made the promise for healing, or for provision, or whatever you're believing God for. So He has already made the promise. So it's not about whether. God wants you to have it. He's said you can have it because he made the promise. So now I must connect with that promise with an act of my will, determined will saying, God, I will have it. If I'm in this passive state of God, give it to me if you want to, or I will have it if, God, if you want me to, I cannot exercise faith. Because I'm just leaving it to maybe, may not be. But when I'm on this state saying, God, you have spoken, I want it. I will have it. You know, we are in Matthew 15, 28. He told the woman, oh daughter, great is your faith. Be it to you as you will. Or be it to you as you desire. Right? So you'll find in the teachings of Jesus, he said, you, you will. You know, John 15, 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it will be done for you. And you ask what you desire, ask what you want. But you're in this position where you are in him, his words are abiding in you. So obviously, we're not going to ask anything out of that, out, 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 not in alignment with this word. That's why he says, you ask what you will, your will is involved. Okay, so when we're ministering to people, just like Jesus, it's important to take the time to make sure that their will is in the right place. 
you know, a classic example in Matthew 20 is uh, the blind man. And we have, we have spoken about him. Uh, the blind man cries out, you know, the, Jesus is passing by. He says, son of David, have mercy on me. And then you know, people are telling him, keep quiet, keep quiet. But he cries out all the more. Then they bring him to Jesus. And, you know, the interesting question Jesus asks him, Matthew 20, Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus, why even ask this question? He's blind. It's pretty obvious he needs his sight. But I think the reason she's asking that question is, okay, let's be clear. What do you want? Do you want money? Do you want your sight? Because for all you know, you know, uh, he was sitting by the roadside begging, right? So people passing by, and he must have been doing this for a long time. His only expectation was put some money. He wasn't expecting any one of those pastors by to heal him. So now he's crying out to Jesus. Jesus saying, what do you want me to do for you? Meaning, what, where's your will? Do you will for money or do you will for your eyesight? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And he stated it very clearly. This is what I want. I want my sight. So Jesus, from you, I'm asking something different. All the others passing by, I'm asking money. But from you, I'm asking, I want my sight. And Jesus need, wanted him to express that. So I think very important. When people come for prayer, when you and I are ministering to people, we have to encourage them to say, hey, this is the promise of God. Be determined to receive it. Don't be in a half-hearted state. Don't be, you know, if I get it, it's okay. If I don't get it, it's okay. No, we are determined. God, I must have it. I must receive my healing. You know, uh, your will is involved and uh, in order to exercise faith. The next important element about faith and ministering the supernatural is that when we minister, when we minister, remember, we also have to minister to people in faith, right? So uh, let's look at Galatians 3 and verse 3. I just want somebody to read it. Um, maybe some of, us, some of us may be familiar with it, but let's, um, Galatians 3. Um, sorry, I got a, uh, Galatians 3, uh, let's read, I said verse 3, no, Galatians 3, let's read please, verse 2 and 5, Galatians 3, let me type it in the chat, Galatians 3, verses 2 and 5, read that please, Galatians 3, Verses 2 and 5. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing your faith? 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Mm. So uh, Galatians, of course, is you know Paul's epistle where he's dealing with uh, uh, the believers in this area uh, in Galatia, um, trying to help them understand it's not by law, but it's by faith in Christ that this Christian life is lived. Now, along that, he's saying, okay, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Verse 2, Galatians 3, verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the law or by faith? And then he says in verse 5, the one who provides or ministers the Spirit to you and works miracles, does that happen by the law or by faith? In other words, God working through his vessels. Of course, you can imagine when Paul went in, uh, Paul and his team um, 
yeah, yeah, they went to Galatia on the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, and second missionary journey, Paul and Silas. So when they ministered, um, God is working through them. So they, the people received the Holy Spirit. They received miracles. And Paul is asking, did that happen by the law or was it by faith? And it's very interesting, by the hearing of faith, meaning there was a preaching of the word involved, which, will, which is our next point. But the point I want to emphasize here is this, that in ministering the works of the Spirit, in ministering healings or miracles, it is done through faith. So we as instruments, right, as we minister to people, we ourselves must be in a place of faith as we minister to people. Okay, that means you and I are convinced that God is healer, that God is deliverer, that God is miracle worker, that God will, you know, meet the need of the people. So you and I are not saying, well, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen. No, we are ministering in faith, right? So when, uh, this is very important when doing the work of the ministry, you and I be in a place of faith. Now, just speaking practically, uh, there may be times when you feel great faith and there may be times when you don't feel a lot of faith and we're going to minister anyway we're going to pray for people anyway sometimes you know uh, there may be a lot of doubts in our minds about certain things uh, you know when people describe the situation say hey please pray for me you ask them what do you want me to pray for and they'll be you know they'll tell you the problem and it's like whoa uh, this seems too difficult or whatever, you know, obviously in the natural, there'll be doubts in our minds, but you and I must learn to minister by faith in the word of God, even when there are all these questions in our mind. You say, God, this person has told me their problem. There's no way I can figure out in my mind how that problem can be addressed. But I believe you. I believe your word. And I'm asking you to intervene, right? So we have got the people in a place where they are determined to receive their will is involved. And then we ourselves are going to minister from a place of faith in God. I'm expecting God to come through no doubts, no questions asked. There may be questions in my mind simply because of the situation or whatever they've said. But as far as God is concerned, his word, his truth, our hearts, my heart has to be settled in that. And I'm ministering from a place of faith. And you can you know, look back at the example of the disciples of Jesus during his earthly ministry and uh, the times that has been recorded for us uh, when they didn't see results, in all the, in both those times, Jesus only said, or the, the 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 point of failure that Jesus, you know, pointed to was faith. And when they came and said, "Why could we not cast the demon out?" He said, "Because of your unbelief." Right. So he was. This is to his own disciples because of your unbelief. He didn't say it was not God's will. He didn't say the people didn't have enough faith. No, because your unbelief, who? The people doing the ministry, the people ministering. He said, because of your unbelief. So what I want to emphasize is for you and me as believers, when we are ministering, we need to minister from a place of faith. And one of the things that you and I must do is to keep ourselves in a place of faith. So that's why, you know, I, I, I encourage you and me as people who want to be, you know, used by God and, and ministering to people to uh, constantly hear the word of God. You know, hear um, the word of God 
concerning healing, concerning miracles, uh, concerning you know things that will build your faith up so that you stay in that place of faith. So that you don't know when you're going to get a call from somebody saying, hey, please pray for me or, you know, uh, when the need comes. So you and I keep ourselves in this place of faith and also for your own self in your, in your, in your various things of life, exercise your faith. Because in the end, it's the same faith that you're going to use to help somebody else. The faith that you use for your own life situations to believe God, the same muscle that you use uh, to do things for your own self in your life, that same muscle you're going to use to help somebody else. So that's how I want to place that as a challenge before each of us and keep your faith strong so that you can be available to minister to people when they come. But connected the next step here, connected to this about faith is take the time to establish people in the word of God, right? So take the time to do that. Uh, right here, you know, you can see when in verse two and verse five, and Paul is saying, he says, by the hearing of faith, uh, the the understanding is like he spoke to them first. You know, he, he brought the word to them, which built faith, and they could then receive, right? So take the time to teach people how to receive by faith. Um, take the time to teach people how to walk by faith. You know, so the, the the ultimate thing is, hey, they need to know how to do this. They need to know how to receive from God. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, I can pray for them by the anointing of God uh, with faith and they can receive. But then you, you and I are not going to be there every moment of their coming days. So they need to know how they can receive by faith in God. So a great thing, a good thing to do is to teach people. You know, here's how you can receive by faith. Here's how you can walk by faith. Right? So um, let's read these uh, scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. You see Paul's motivation there. First Corinthians 2 and verse 5. Somebody could read that for us, please. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Yeah. So Paul is talking about his ministry. He says, you know, when we came, uh, our preaching was not with, you know, persuasive words of human wisdom, but it's in demonstration of the power of God. What was he trying to achieve? He says, I want your faith to be in God, in the power of God, not in our words or our abilities, right? So we want people's faith to be placed in God. And so whatever you can do to encourage that, you teach them the word, you uh, teach them you know, how to have faith in God. So that ultimately their faith must be in God, not in the man, not in the man's anointing. I mean, it's good that we are, you know, we are anointed and, uh, you know, God uses us and uh, we can pray in faith. All of that is fine. But we want people's faith to be placed in God, in the power of God. Their faith must be there in, in God. So that when we move, move out of the way, they can still learn how to receive from God. Right. So that's how we work. So take the time to do that. Right. Uh, it may mean sometimes that you sit down and you open the scriptures and say, hey, let me, you know, in the case of healing, let me share the word of God with you on healing. This is why you and I can believe God for healing. See, most, most people just want us to wave a magic wand and make healing happen. They think, okay, you come and lay your hands on me and healing will be done or just do this and healing will happen. There are times, we will see in the other keys, God moves sovereignly. God moves by his presence. God moves by you know, the gifts of the spirit. And those are all part of the keys. We are open to it. But the best thing to do 
is to say, hey, let me take you to the Word of God. Let me show you why you can believe God for your healing. Right? So what we're doing, we are placing their faith not in the anointing you and I carry, not in the faith you and I can exercise, but we are helping them place their faith in God. And that's the best thing we can do in ministering the supernatural, right? Get people to place their faith in God. Because when you and I are not around, maybe, you know, some months later, they may need to believe God for something else. Maybe they need to believe God for their own healing. They don't have to call you. They don't have to send you a prayer request. They will know how they can have faith in God themselves. So keep this in mind. I'm not saying this is the only way God will work, but I'm saying faith is an important key. And if you and I can help people learn how to have faith in God, we are really give, putting the key in their hands rather than them coming to us all the time that they can believe God and they will see things happen, okay? And uh, just a few more thoughts connected to that. Yeah, so while we teach people to receive by faith, to walk by faith, we also, you know, keep them open to the sovereign or the supernatural encounter with God's presence. So there is a balance, right? That uh, while I'm saying, hey, this is how you have faith in God, also be open to the more of the spirit. And I remember uh, this happened uh, maybe of course, this was before the pandemic, so I, I forget which year, but one of the years before the pandemic, there's a lady in the church who, she went to the doctor and the uh, doctor said, you've got a lump in your breast and uh, you know we have to do the biopsy and all of those things to find out what's going on. Now, uh, we uh, there was going to be a worship night happening and this was at one of our locations where they were having a worship night it was you know we call it bangalore south that means uh, so in bangalore we have five locations so one of the locations bangalore south now this lady was actually part of our central congregation but uh, no so this had happened uh but the Bangalore South was having a worship night. Now, worship night is just a night where you, you know we are not doing. There's no preaching of the word, nothing. It's just us coming together for worship, just worship. But she and her husband. Now they didn't have to do this, right? Uh, they drove intentionally from where they lived, a different part of town. They drove intentionally to south to be at the worship night and her expectation was simply this i'm expecting to be healed in the presence of god okay so I, i'm sharing this because there is this dimension to faith as well right so on the one side there is okay the word of god and you know believe the promise but we must also learn how by faith to tap into the presence so that's what this lady was doing, right? Or went to do. So she and her husband drove to the worship night. She had come from the doctor. Doctor said, this is a thing. You, you know, we have to do a biopsy, whatever. She went to the worship night with the expectation, God, I'm going to be in your presence and I want to be healed because there's healing in your presence. So I've been emphasizing, you know, faith and the word of God. But I'm just saying, this is the other side. We must also awaken people too. That there's faith in the presence of God, the supernatural move of God. So she went there. And uh, nobody knows when. Sometime in that two hours of worship, and it was just worship, right? 
sometime in that two hours of worship, her, the growth disappeared. Nobody laid hands, nobody, uh, nobody, uh, there was no preaching of the word. There was no like specific prayer or anything. So what, what happened? Faith, God's presence. Okay. So while we teach people, the primary thing is faith in God through his word. Okay. This is the promise. Your will is involved. You must believe the promise. And this is how you exercise your faith in God. You teach them, you know, the steps of Abraham. And this is how Abraham believed the promise of God. And all that is important. But at the same time, you must also teach people that, hey, uh, God works by his word, but also God works other ways. He works by the, his, the gifts of the spirit. He works through his manifest presence. So healing can come through his word, but healing can also come through the gifts of the spirit, you know, where uh, through words of knowledge and gifts of healings and all of that. And healing can come also to the manifest presence of God. That means when you are in the presence of God, you are connecting with God, your faith is in the power of God and his presence brings healing. Okay, so uh, I'm just expanding what I have been saying. That is, we emphasize having faith in the word of God, but also open people up to these other dimensions, the other ways, which we will talk about these in, 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 the, in the coming weeks. Open them up to these other dimensions of the presence of God. That you know, in the presence of God, healing can happen, deliverance can happen, uh, needs can be met. All right, so open people up to that aspect as well. The key is to teach them how to have faith in the Word of God. Teach them the steps of faith, which we have learned in, in from you know Romans four seventeen to twenty one, uh, the steps of faith. This is how we exercise faith um, in God. But at the same time, be open, right, to receiving healing from God's presence. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, we just look, quickly look at a couple of verses there um, on uh, healing from the presence of God. I'll just uh, share a few quick verses. Luke 5, verse 17. Somebody can read that. Uh, I'll just give a few verses. So Luke 5, verse 17. Somebody. In Luke 5, 17. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Mm. So, you know, the people are gathered here. It says, uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, yeah, Luke 5, it says, so, you know, there are all these people in the room. It says, the power of the Lord was present to heal. Right? So, of course, it's talking about the presence of God, the anointing of God over there. Now, let's just look at a few more verses. I'll, I'll just mention this quickly. Malachi 4 and verse 2. It says, uh, uh, Malachi 4, verse 2. It says, uh, to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. So it's drawing a picture of God as uh, the sun and his, uh, you know, the sun shines, the sun gives ray, his rays. Uh, and it says he will arise with healings, healing in his wings. Another scripture is Habakkuk chapter three and verse four. 
you know, it's talking about the brightness of God's presence. Habakkuk 3 verse 4. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand and there his power was hidden. So it's talking about the brightness of God, the light of God's presence. And in that light, his power is present. Right? So that means he's just talking about the presence of God as light, as powerful light. But what is in that light? His power. His power is there in that presence. Um, and the last passage um, would be, I, I really like this passage, is Psalm 132, verses 13 to 18. Uh, Psalm 132, verse 13 to 18. It's talking about God dwelling, right? God dwelling among his people. So that's the presence of God. How does God dwell among us? By his presence, right? And um, while he is dwelling amongst us, he's going to bless us. What's he going to do? He says in verse 15, uh, I will provide for them. I will clothe them, verse 16, I will clothe them with salvation. And salvation is a comprehensive word, which includes healing, which includes deliverance and so on. They will shout aloud for joy. So in the presence of God, where God is dwelling, there is provision, there is healing. And as you read the rest of the verses, you will see there is victory, there is revelation, and there is uh, there is triumph over the enemy. So Psalm 132, 13 to 18 is like God is dwelling, his presence is resting, and in his presence, God does these things, right? He, he provides, he heals, he delivers, he brings joy, uh, he brings strength, he brings revelation, uh, he causes people to triumph over all of that. So just these different verses that show that in the presence of God, where God dwells, where there is his light, where he rises up with wings, there is healing there. Is that okay, Beth? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So to sum up this, this key on faith, we can apply this for us personally, but we are talking about ministering to people first. See if they really want it. Their will must be involved. If they come saying, Pastor, if more God wants to give it to me, it's okay, you pray for me. I said, you know, no, no. Your will must be involved. What do you want God to do for you? Do you really want God to do this? Do you really want God to heal you? Do you really want God to deliver you? Do you really want God to intervene? I mean, is your will aligned to his promise, right? Second, make sure you are in a place of faith, right? As a minister of God, you have to be in a place of faith when you're ministering. So the best thing to do is to keep yourself uh, ready to minister. Third is encourage their faith with the word of God. Show them how to exercise faith and take some time to uh, share the scriptures, meditate in the word, uh, hear the word of God. And many times, you know, if, if you're in a congregational setting, many times, you know, people receive their healing, people receive their miracle just by hearing the word. You know, why? Because when you're ministering the word and giving them the promise, it connects in their spirit, they believe it, they will receive their healing. Okay. But as a minister of God, take the time to build their faith, give them the word, even though they may want you to just do some, you know, quick thing, you're looking at the long term. How can they receive, you know, learn to receive from God? So take the time to do it. Get them to put their faith in God, not in the anointing on you, not in uh, the gifts in you, not in you as a pastor or a preacher or a minister or whatever. Get them to put their faith in God and exercise their faith in God. So that's a major part of the key of faith. That's why we minister the word week after week. Uh, we teach God's people the word of God. Why? Because we want them to learn how they can have faith in God for life's situations. While you're doing that, also encourage people by saying that, look, there are other ways God heals. There are gifts of the Spirit. We will talk about those things, okay? There are the gifts of the Spirit. There is the presence of God. 
uh, there is the anointing, the flow of the anointing, be open to that. So let people understand that there are more than one ways in which, one way in which their miracle can come to them. And sometimes God may choose to touch them in a way that's different, right? Meaning through the presence of God, meaning through a gift of the spirit or through the flow of his anointing, right? So that way they are being opened. The faith, faith is in God, but they're open to more than one way in which God's healing can come to them, okay? I will pause now on the second key. So we've covered two keys. One is to, uh, to understand the realm of the spirit. Second is the key of faith, right? So we're talking about how you can get that key to operate when you're ministering to people, okay? I'll pause here and uh, if the, uh, we'll take any questions on this. Uh, Let's look on. Can you see all this? Yes. Any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's close. Uh, if there are no questions, we will close. Uh, I just want to pray together and uh, pray that God will use each one of us uh, as um, vessels uh, of honor that uh, we will be vessels that will bring forth the supernatural uh, into the lives of people, that people can experience and encounter God powerfully, supernaturally, okay? Um, just want somebody to lead us in that prayer along that line, just to pray for all of us, that God would use us to release his supernatural work in the lives of people. Can somebody lead us in prayer for that, please? And then we will dismiss. Can we cast out demons if we are not physically there? All right, we have a question. Uh, the answer is yes, but uh, we can do that. You know, um, when we're not physically present, uh, we can mention. A, I have ministered on the phone, uh, uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting. This happened some time back. Uh, uh, you know, we have a church in Orissa. Uh, 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 we have a church in Orissa where the pastor's there. And one day they brought this person who was demon possessed there. And uh, the pastor was ministering, of course, but he decided he to call me. And when he was going to pick up the phone to call, the demon started speaking and they said, I know who you're going to call. You know, you're going to call your, I mean, they use the local language to say your, you know, senior pastor, let's say. The demons are speaking. I know you're going to call. No, don't call. You know, so, but anyway, he did call and we prayed and ministered and that person was delivered. Uh, so this was, uh, you know, uh, done on the phone. And now uh, there is no distance uh, in the spirit. So in the spirit, you speak uh, and minister. And uh, it doesn't matter if we are separated geographically. You speak words, um, whatever language, and uh, they will be ministered uh, to. Yeah. How do we speak to them? Since demons are infinite. Yeah, so wherever they are operating, you're taking authority. And in the realm of the spirit, there is no distance. And you speak to that person, persons, or that situation, and uh, you deal with those demonic powers uh, that way. Okay, yeah, so they are in that physical location or in that individual who may be, you know, uh, many, many miles or just kilometers away. They are there. But in the spirit, you're operating in the spirit. Uh, there is no distance, and you can rebuke those spirits. Okay. 
Anita, is that a question, Anita? Uh, Psalm 31, where is healing and deliverance? Is that a question? Pastor, would, if I say that, <clears throat> I just wanted to know if the interpretation would be right if I say it is healing and deliverance scripture. Or, or, or whether this scripture is talking about healing. Let me just turn there. Psalm 31. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Um, into your hand I commit my spirit. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, personally, I, I don't see it as such. Uh, Psalm 31 verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have it be me, O God of truth. I mean, I know the Lord Jesus prayed, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, but I don't see that, Anita, uh, in Psalm 31 verse 5. Um, the promise for healing. Uh, when in Tiana come in my spirit, you have redeemed me, or maybe maybe from that, you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Into your hand I commit my spirit. So I'm saying, Lord, I'm committing my spirit to you. Uh, you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Now, re you know, redemption could be, you know, being set free from anything. In this case, you, I guess you can apply it to uh, sickness, disease, or any other situation. Is that how you yeah. Are yeah, I was looking at it from the point of view of the uh, person whom you experience, like you uh, told the, her testimony, like if she goes in the worship uh, presence of God, like if she says that, yes, I am committing myself into your hands, my spirit, you, you will redeem me from this. That's what I meant. I see. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. So you have something to say? It's fine, but I still see it more primarily as a prayer of protection, um, you know, from the dangers that the enemy puts ahead of us, you know, to box us somewhere and to take our lives or, you know, something like that. But it can still be used in the sense of deliverance. But primarily, I think this is more like a prayer of protection mm -hmm. over yourself or it could be for someone else. Yeah. That's that's the way I see it. Good. Good. All right. Um, I'm looking at Beth. Uh, uh, if the human is not speaking to you, they are far away. No connection by phone or anything. I see. Uh, so Beth is, if the human is not speaking to you and they are far away, let no connection by phone. Yes, but I, I believe uh, that can happen. You know, when we look at Jesus and uh, the way he ministered, uh, example, uh, quickly with examples, when you think about, uh, you know, the Roman centurion's servant, uh, when you think about the Canaanite woman's daughter, uh, she was troubled by demons. Uh, the Roman centurion's servant was paralyzed, so we don't know the real cause of the paralysis. Um, now, these were all uh, at a distance, right? Jesus was in one place. Uh, these people who were ill or who were demon-possessed were in a different place. And he just spoke the word. He said, you know, you know, go your way. You're, you know, you, you, according to your faith, be done for you. And uh, the daughter was at home, troubled. Uh, Jesus had no connection with her in the sense that he was not, you know, he's not talking to her or nothing, but she was delivered. So um, the answer to your question is yes. And uh, there are times, I mean, many of times we pray like that when I know of a situation where, uh, you know, so I might just pray. I may not even call the person, but I might pray over that situation. But we are doing this exact thing, which is uh, we are in one location and, uh, and we are dealing with the situation uh, uh, somewhere else. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, Jesus spoke to the demon, but here he did not. Yeah, we don't have a record of him doing that, but I, I guess it's the faith that was involved and, and uh, you know, the miracle happened because somebody was in faith. The Roman centurion, the Canaanite woman, 
and uh, the person was delivered. Uh, now we don't exactly, maybe Jesus did speak, it's just not recorded for us. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but somebody was in faith and the deliverance took place. Yeah. Uh, can a demonized person's vision and prophecy can be from the Holy Spirit? Uh, Shri Kumar's question. Um, can a demonized person's vision prophecy can be from the Holy Spirit? Can the Holy Spirit work through somebody who's demonized or demon possessed? Hmm. Uh, okay, see, normally it will not be so, right? If a person is demon possessed, uh, it's the evil spirit speaking through that person. Uh, and so we will we will not expect that. Yeah, watch it. Go ahead, Shri Kumar. Uh, Pastor, if uh, no, it's not a de uh, she's a demon, demonized like uh, whenever the worship happens, some um, very rare cases she used to possess also. But in some cases, when she's in worship, she used to see visions and she prophesied also. So that's that's my doubt that uh, and her prophecies and visions are accurate. But uh, many times, when the uh, in worship uh, or um, uh, in certain uh, situations. Uh, she used to scream and uh, she says that she's uh, somebody's trying to chalk her. She get into a stage of depressions and that also parallelly happening. So mm -hmm. I just want to know that. Uh, but uh, many times when she's in uh, like uh, under the anointing, she used to see, she used to prophesy, she prophesied, she speaks in tongues and her visions, the uh, prophecies are accurate. So that's why I just have a doubt that uh, um, how we can, uh, you know, uh, see this thing and how we can analyze that whether it is from like a person is uh, you know what she's saying is seems to be right and it's right people say that what she's telling is right but in many cases in sometimes uh, she also get uh, even at home when she maybe in the night midnight she screams and all and uh, she she get into uh, very uh, like or she feels that she's uh, something is shocking her and uh, she get into a uh, um, depression so in that case, how we can take uh, take her prophecies and visions, uh, even it is right. So how I, I should or somebody uh, should see it. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what you are describing is a real situation. That means there is a believer. Um, he or she is born again, loves Jesus, you know, maybe filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, reading the Bible. Uh, living as just as any other Christian. Uh, so they are born again. They are genuinely saved. But at the same time, there are areas in their lives where they are still affected by demonic powers. And, uh, you know, we understand it. Uh, so they will have that problem manifesting, right? But at the same time, they are saved. They love Jesus but there are parts of their soul or their body where they are troubled, affected, you know, and, and, and yeah, we've seen cases that way. So to answer your question, yes, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in them and the Holy Spirit will manifest through them. And those things we can take, when the Holy Spirit is moving through them, we can receive it. But at the same time, we need to help them overcome those areas where they are still struggling. And, and you know, usually, usually, I'm not, I'm not saying all the time, but usually, when people come from deeply spiritual backgrounds, you know, they've been worshiping gods and goddesses and those kinds of things, and they come, you know, they come to the Christian faith. You will find this kind of a problem where they have generally accepted Christ, they're born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, water baptized, serving in church, but then suddenly they have certain areas where they are troubled by demonic spirits, they will have manifestations as though they're demon possessed. They're not demon possessed. They're just demonized or being troubled. And uh, so the answer to your question is yes. When, you know, when they're really generally manifesting under the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, you can, you know, encourage them, receive them. But then we need to work with them to, you know, see the deliverance happen in those areas where they are struggling. And this is not because they're demon possessed. They're just struggling, demonized in maybe part of the soul or part of the body for various reasons, yeah. So we can receive. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Avni, if you have a question, we'll take it and then we're going to pray. And I see uh, Rose's prayer request. Yeah. Yes. You Pastor. have a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question, uh, actually, I had two, but I'll first start with uh, uh, when <laughs> the deliverance takes place, is it important that uh, it will uh, show some physical manifestation or it can be a very quiet deliverance also? So the answer is yes. In fact, a lot of deliverances happen very quietly. So in the church services, you know, uh, a lot of deliverances actually happen very quickly. Yeah. Because why? The word of God is being ministered and prayers are being made and demons leave quietly. People don't know, but they see the fruit. That means they are, now they experience freedom. They see that there's victory in certain areas of life. So the answer is yes. Okay. And uh, uh, is a religious spirit uh, an evil spirit, Pastor? Yes. So there is there are evil spirits that operate in the realm of religion. Uh, Paul mentions about this in several places. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about, you know, in the latter days, the Holy Spirit is saying that men will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So there are demons behind these spiritual teachings. So they are religious spirits. Paul also talks about in 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 11, he talks about, uh, you know, messengers of Satan presenting themselves as angels of light, you know, so those demonic spirits appear in religious environments and so on. So the answer is yes. But their agenda is definitely to take people away from the faith, but they come in this manner operating in this circle, the religious circle. Thank you, Pastor. One more question. Uh, what if someone wants the healing and uh, you've been sharing Christ with them, but they're not interested to know about God, about love of God and Christ, but they want healing uh, because they're suffering because of some, uh, you know, um, d very serious uh, ailment, uh, suppose cancer. There's a friend of mine who's an unbeliever. She comes from a different faith. She wants healing, but uh, she doesn't want to hear about Jesus and uh, believe in Jesus, but uh, she wants the healing. Uh, she doesn't want to pray with, but she wants to be prayed for. So in that case, uh, how should we uh, help them out? Yeah, that's an interesting situation. I, I would just uh, do this. You know, I would tell her, look, I'm, I'm praying in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. It's Jesus Christ who's going to heal you. And uh, when you're healed, know that he's the one who healed you. Right? And you just pray and you minister. You know, you don't hold back. Uh, you know, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, so many people came to him for healing. We all we don't know whether I mean whether they all came with the right heart and right motive. In fact, the sixth chapter of John says, you know, Jesus saw that all who came left. You know, all these people who came, they the ones who received healing. They are the ones who ate the fire, you know, the loaves and the fish. They had everything. And then when he started teaching them, they all left. And then Jesus turns around to his twelve disciples and says, Are you also going to go away? You know, so what an interesting, what a situation, you know, all these people, they had received their healing, they saw the miracles, but when Jesus started teaching them, they left. So um, the answer is, you know, let's minister to people, let's pray for them with the intent that God, through the miracle, maybe their heart will be changed and they will come to Jesus. You know, so you don't hold back, you still pray, still minister uh, and you know, if um, they receive a miracle, then it may be an opportunity for them to turn to the Lord. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, pray. And we're going to close in prayer. So we're going to pray for two things. One is just to pray for all of us that we will be used by God in the supernatural. And then we're going to pray for uh, Rose's daughter. Really cough and breathing clear in images. Thank you. Okay, Rose, what's her name? We can just call her name out and pray. And, uh, Davy, Pastor Davy. D A V E Y. D A V E Y. Davy. D A V E Y. Davy. D A V E Y. Okay. All right. Let's just all pray together before we dismiss. I'll just pray. Um, okay, Father, we. Thank you for this time where we could 
share, discuss, learn. I pray, Father, most of all, for the stirring up of the uh, the gifts of God, for the stirring up of the anointing of God, the moving of your spirit upon each of our lives, that we will be vessels of honor who will display your supernatural power that brings healing, brings deliverance, brings miracles in the lives of many people. May each of us be such kind of vessels. And Father, right now we pray over Devi, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every affliction, over her breathing, over her um, um, over cough or respiratory infection. We command irritation. We command that to leave that healing flow right now. That healing flow right now. And they will be healed. In the name of Jesus, be healed, be well. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. I thank you. I know we've taken uh, extra time. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Prabhakar. God bless you. Thank you, you Pastor. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Siddhant. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Sir. Pilar, thank you, Pastor. Abhishek, Anita, Pratik, Louis, Salome. Uh, God bless you, each one of you. See you again.